Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a huge pleasure and also an honor for me to introduce Professor Mo Moshe Vardi uh, from uh, University of Houston, Texas. Um, well, Moshe has something like a 50 page long uh, CV, so I will try to summarize this uh, very quickly. Uh, well, for the non computer, so I, I'm pretty sure that every computer scientist knows Moshe very well. But for non-computer scientists, I would say that he is very well known in computer science and engineering, and mostly for his uh, many contribution in um, relating logic and computer science in fields like, uh, in particular, knowledge compilation, knowledge representation, automatic reasoning, uh, um, computerized verification, complexity theory, database theory as well, plus others. He's co-author or over 700 papers and two very famous books, uh, recently about knowledge and uh, fine model theory and its applications, which we know very well. Well, he's a recipient of 14, I've counted them, 14 international awards, including uh, Goethe Prize, uh, Blaise Pascal Medal, Herbert Awards, Coleman Award, the Knuth Prize. And um, he has eight honorary doctorates and is a fellow of nine international scientific societies and uh, academies, including Association of Computing Machinery, which is the, the main association of uh, computer science uh, and others. And uh, he has served for a decade as a editor in chief for communication of the ACM, which is the main, uh, let's say, magazine for, for computer science. Okay, but here uh, we are not calling him, uh, we have not invited him to speak uh, for a technical talk, one of his many technical talks in computer science. Rather, uh, because apart from his, uh, I would say, outstanding scientific career, Pro um, Professor Bard is very well known also for his uh, many editorial, in particular in communication of ACM, and his many lectures relating science and technology with society and politics. And that's actually why uh, we in invited him to give a talk in which we speak about technology and democracy. Okay, so I, I just want to say that uh, if you want to give a question at the end of the talk, please type them on, uh, on the chat and then we'll read them. Okay, so please, Moshe, thank you very much. Buonasera. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. So I will talk to you about technology and democracy. And uh, I do want to apologize that my perspective will, will be very, very US perspective. But hopefully you listen to that and you'll see what does it also mean for Europe and for Italy. So I'm going to go back to 1989. This is where uh, it's become clear that uh, the, the Soviet bloc is about to, to go under. And uh, political scientist United States, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book that was got a lot of attention at the time, The End of History and the Last Man. And in a nutshell, this, the idea of the, of the book was the triumph of the West, of the Western idea, is evident first of all in the total exhaustion of viable systematic alternative Western liberalism. Western liberalism was essentially uh, the combination of democracy and free market. Now, rumors are that when history got a copy of the book, history was not happy. History said the end of me, I'm going to show you guys. So let's see how history decided to show us that, that history is alive and well. And I'm going to go and look at, at the, uh, the Association of Computing Machinery, which is the, the, the premier society, professional society in computing. And let's go over and look at one decade in the history of the association. In 2012, the association celebrated the Turing centenary, the 100th anniversary of Turing's birth. Turing is the closest we have in some sense to patron states in computing. It was a celebration of computing. Look at us, we are so important, we are so great. Five years later, it was 50 years for the Turing Award. The Turing Award is the Nobel Prize in Computing. Again, a celebration of computing. Look at us, our technology is ascendant. And then last year, in June 10 of last year, ACM celebrated its 75th birthday. Now the tone was very, very different. 
the panelists will imagine what might be next for technology and society in the years to come. And if you go look at the program, you'll see that much of it was about societal impact of computing. It was not just let's celebrate the technology. And one very well-known participant who will rename, rename nameless for now wrote on, on Facebook, I found the whole thing a little depressing. Why can we just not continue to celebrate technology and ignore society? But we cannot disassociate what's happening in computing and what's happening in society at large. Notice the date, June 10 of 2022. A, year, a day before that, Congress started its hearing about the January 6th insurrection in the United States, where we eventually learned that the President of the United States tried to subvert the lawful transfer of power in the United States. This is the closest we've had to, to collapse of democracy in the United States. It was, it was on J January 6th, but the hearing started just the day before the ACM meeting. And two weeks before the ACM meeting, on May 24, 2022, a gunman, a young gunman in Uvalde, Texas, killed 19 children and, uh, and two teachers using a assault rifle. Um, very, very, I mean, I'm still, you know, it's very hard when you see all this mass shooting in the United States. It is really hard to come to, to, to deal with it. Now, these events, I mentioned these events because these events point to a very deep polarization in American society. In July of last year, there was a poll by the New York Times about, about Trump. 92% of Democrats thought that he thinks that he threatened US democracy. But among Republicans, 76% think he was just exercising his right to contest the election. Deep, deep disagreement about guns. Uh, just after the Uvalde massacre, there was an, a, a national public radio a, a, a poll about banning assault, assault uh, weapons in the United States among gun owners. Among Democratic gun owners, 84% were in favor of a ban. Among Republican gun owners, 75% are against the ban. Depolarization. When society, when society is so deeply polarized, democracy is in danger. Because democracy requires minimal level of trust. We trust that everybody will follow the same rules. In December 2021, George Shultz, who used to be Secretary of State in the United States, he, was a, he, he died a month later, he was over 100 years old, and he wrote about trust. He said, trust is necessary. When trust was in the room, good things happen. When trust was not in the room, good things did not happen. Everything else is detailed. And when you have polarization, trust disappears. So now people are seriously speculating whether the United States can continue to exist as a United States. Here is an People are talking about the disunited states. An article from September 2022, will the United States break apart into red and blue confederacies? Red is Republican, blue are democratic states. And here in Texas, a year ago, a year and a half ago, the Republican party added to its platform to call for a voter referendum, whether or not the state of Texas should reassert its status as independent nation called Texit. And for people who don't know, before Texas joined the United States, after it, it seceded from Mexico, and for nine years was independent republic. And now people are talking about leaving the United States and becoming independent republic again. And I want to read this, this paragraph in full because I think it is just, you must listen to it. This is an article from February of this year. How is it? that politicians are banning books in a country whose founding First Amendment protect the right to free speech. How is it the US, despite its wealth and technology, leads the world with more than 1 million deaths from COVID-19, more than any other nation on earth? Maybe not China has surpassed us. How is it that insurrectionists could storm the citadel of American democracy in a crusade to overturn a presidential election? How is it we actually saw a Confederate flag in, in the, inside the US Capitol that a rioter in our era could deliver the Confederate flag farther than General Robert E. Lee himself. 
And so when you look at this kind of situation, one big question is what went wrong? Who broke the United States? What is going on? And I have no doubt that historian will spend the next 50 years trying to answer this question. But I think we need answers now. We cannot wait 50 years. We can start repairing the damage unless we understand what caused it. And I will try to offer some explanation. I will focus on, on technology. There are other things that I will not be able to discuss and I won't get into them. They're also relevant, but one hour talk, you must, you must focus. So I'm going to go back to 1981 because three pivotal events in the United States happened in 1981. Number one, September 6, I arrived as a postdoc at Stanford University. Um, this is just a joke. This is not so pivotal. But less than a month before I arrived, IBM introduced the IBM personal computer model 5150. Nobody remember model 5150. It is known as the IBM PC. That was in just three weeks before I arrived. And earlier in the year, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as the president of the United States, January of, of 20, 1981. So let's first look, talk about the IBM PC. The IBM PC was a smashing business success within shortly just one over one year after it was launched. Time Magazine, that usually Time Magazine put in January of each year, it puts the person of the year on the cover. Now Time Magazine put the machine of the year, the computer moves in and you see a machine sitting on a desktop and a person looking, it doesn't look, the person doesn't look very happy. The man doesn't look very happy, looks at the machine. But the IBM PC was the beginning of a tsunami of technology. By the mid 1980s, every knowledge worker has a computer on their desk. By the late 1980s, every knowledge worker took, took a computer home. The World Wide Web was introduced in 1989. Internet went commercial in 1995. Google was launched three years later. Facebook, Facebook was launched in 2004. The iPhone was introduced in 2007. So we have the world we live in today, you can say in some sense it started with the IBM PC. Tsunami of technology. But Ronald Reagan becoming president of the United States launched a tsunami of neoliberalism. What is neoliberalism? It's a very extreme form of free market capitalism. Some people call it a market fundamentalism. It, you know, there are many, many legs, you know, less a fair redu reduction in government spending, privatization, deregulation, monetarism, tax reduction, globalization, free trade, basically try to take the government out of the market as much as possible. This is neoliberalism. Now, you have to understand neoliberalism is not just an economic approach. Here is from a book from 2015 by Wendy Brown. Neoliberalism is not an ideology that favors the market. Rather, it disseminates the model of the market to all domains and activities, even when money is not the issue and configure human beings exhaustively as market actors. Always, only and everywhere is homo economicus. Markets, markets, markets. This is, this is neoliberalism. Now, the ideas, the fundamental idea of neoliberalism, you can go back to Adam Smith, who talks about the invisible hand. This actually was in a book, not in the wealth of nation, but in the theory of moral sentiments. He wrote about the market. He talks about the marvel of market. It's, it's, a, it's magic. I want to buy, I want it. I need a loaf of bread. I go to the market. I give them, you know, who knows, a shilling. I get a loaf of bread. I don't know the baker. The baker doesn't know me. We all come out happy from the transaction. So he wrote, they're led by an invisible hand. And so without intending it, without knowing it, they advance the interest of society as a whole and provide means for the survival of the species. So using markets, we're going to the survival of the species. But if you look, what is the fundamental idea that each agent in the market optimizes for him or herself. And this was rephrased in a, in a famous movie from 1987 called Wall Street. There's a character called Gordon Gekko and he gave a fiery speech. And he said, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of better word, is good. Greed is, greed is right. We can all be greedy and it's for the better, it's for the best of society. And this idea actually goes back to a Dutch philosopher, Bernard Mandeville, in the early 18th century. 
and he had the parable of the bees. And uh, he has that when the bees start to become him to become virtuous, the, the argument is the, the hive will collapse. And again, the idea from Mandeville was that private vice, private greed creates social benefits. Greed is good. So this is a, 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 a in some sense, it's a, it's a wonderful ideology. Each one of us will be completely selfish and it's going to be for the, for the, for it's going to be optimal for society. That was the ideology. So let's see how well it worked for society. So look, for example, what happened at US manufacturing. There is a, a common belief that US manufacturing has declined because all manufacturing is now done in, in China or Mexico. But if you look at, at, uh, at the data, you see that this is not the case. US manufacturing volume in real dollar, real means adjust for inflation, keeps increasing. But em employment peaked around 1980 and has gone down since. And so that means that many, many millions of manufacturing jobs, which are really good jobs, these were jobs that paid about $50,000 a year, many of them have been lost. And if you look more broadly at what happened to the US economy, economists look at key four key uh, um, indicators. One is productivity. The belief is that productivity is necessary to grow the economy. So you look at labor productivity, GDP, jobs created, and household income. What you see is that until 1983, roughly, these numbers go together. So economists start believing that if you take care of productivity, everything will take care of itself. But that is not the case. You see that over the past 40 years, productivity has continued to increase and GDP continued to increase, but incomes have stagnated and we're not generating as many jobs as we used to generate. The last few years are the years of the pandemic, and that's kind of scrambles everything. So we'll have to wait a few years after the pandemic to see what is new equilibrium. But up to the pandemic, this was the case. And, and one of the un, untold stories, what happened in the United States, is the huge growth of inequality. So this chart shows you what happened to the top 1% versus the bottom 50%. Think about it. Top 1% versus the bottom 50%. In 1962, the top 1% made about 12% of the, of the income, and the bottom 50% made about 20% of the income. By 2016, this has reversed. The top 1% make about 20% of the income, and the bottom 50% make about 12% of the income huge inequality in the United States. And when you look what's happening inside, when you zoom in and you look at jobs, there's kind of an explanation of what's called, this is called polarization, labor polarization. So economists divide the, 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 the labor market into by skills and roughly this corresponds to compensation. So uh, the bottom one third in terms, of the, in terms of salary, the middle and the top, and you see in 1983, about 15% of the jobs were in, were in uh, low skills and 26% were high skill and almost 60% were middle skill. And middle skill is middle class jobs. Well, what happened by, if you look what happened over 40 years, you see that the low skill are roughly the same, more high skill jobs, we have a more sophisticated, more and more job require spreadsheets and word processing and things like that. And the middle skill part of the, of the pie has shrunk. That means there are fewer and fewer uh, middle class jobs. And indeed, when you look at compensation, you see that if you have a graduate degree, then your income has risen faster than inflation. If you have bachelor degree, well, it, you kind of kept up. But if you have less than, less than bachelor degree, especially for men, then you actually have, you have lost income. You have lost ground. And so we are growing, we are seeing a growing economic polarization in the United States. A very nice way to look at this, if I don't know if you have seen The Simpson, it's a, it's a cartoon show, it's a satirical show in the United States. And Homer Simpson is a nuclear safety inspector. This is a working class job, it's a union job. So it pays decently. So if you look at the basic story, you see that the Homer Simpson by himself, he can provide middle-class lifestyle for his family. He doesn't have a college degree, but he has a union job. 
and you know the family is family of five they have a house health insurance he can drink as much beer as he wants middle class life today nobody thinks that uh, that one provider one a uh, working class provider can support a family under such conditions and this has political implication in in september of last year about a year ago luke mogelson wrote in the guardian and he pointed out that uh, if you look at the uh, democratic congressional districts you see that in these districts between 2008 and 2018 income has risen but if you look at republican districts income has fallen so if you want to understand why people voted for trump the main thing is people felt they have lost you can tell them well it's because of uh, automation globalization this is very abstract it's much easier to think your income is rather than your loss income it has been stolen from you especially where people look differently than you so, so economic polarization it's well known that the economic crisis are breeding uh ground for for decline of democracy we can go back to to fascism in italy and nazism in in, in germany and they all started with economic crisis um last july the new york times asked of all of its columnists to write something these are people who write an opinion every week so new york Times asked them to write something they were wrong about each columnist has to write i was wrong about x david brooks the new york times is generally more liberal but david brooks is a conservative columnist and he wrote i was wrong about capitalism and he wrote the most educated americans were amassing more and more wealth dominating the best living areas pouring advantage into their kids a highly unequal caste system was forming so here is a conservative columnist questioning his belief in capitalism so let's let's go back and revisit the free market so the free market promises efficiency what does efficiency mean so here are definition from investopedia Economic efficiency means that good and factor of production are distributed or allocated to their most viable uses and waste is minimized. Furthermore, free market advocates argue that through individual self-interest and freedom of production as well as consumption, economic efficiency is achieved and the best interests of society as a whole are fulfilled. So the argument is that the free market is efficient and that also guarantees optimality. So let's revisit this question. Now it's, a, it's an economic theory question. Does efficiency guarantee optimality? So first of all, what is, what is efficiency? There is something called one of the most important theorems in, in, in microeconomics, it's called the first welfare theorem. Under a certain technical assumption, free market will tend towards a competitive Pareto optimal equilibrium. So this Pareto optimality, this is economic efficiency. So the question is, how much does it serve the best interests of society? And interesting, interestingly, this question was raised by computer scientists, by, by Kutsopias and Pabedmitro in 1999. And they asked the following question. Well, there are many equilibria. You look, at, you look at the game theory, you look at Nash equilibria, there are many possible equilibria. They said, they, they said let's compare tool from an analysis of algorithm to analyzing different Nash equilibria. Let's compare the best Nash equilibrium to the worst Nash equilibrium in terms of social, total societal utility. And the show is that the, there is a huge gap, exponential gap, and this is what is called now the price of anarchy. So without a guiding hand, there's no guarantee that the market will converge to a good Nash equilibrium. So this idea that economic efficiency, which means equilibrium, guarantees optimality it's just plain wrong it's just plain wrong it's, it's just a myth all we can all we get is under some condition we get equilibrium is it a good one or a bad one that's a different story so now i, I try to explain why neoliberalism did not serve us well in some sense it served some people very well but it created a very uh, economically polarized country now i want to go and talk about cognitive polarization and for this, I will first go again again to the Reagan administration. So um, until the, the mid 80s, if you want to watch the news on TV, you use broadcast television and the, the, the channel that the, 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 the broadcast channel have to get a license to the spectrum from the government, the government on the spectrum. 
And so they have to license it. And one of the conditions of the license is that the master present all issues in a balanced way. So if you watch the news, ABC, CBS, NBC, it didn't matter which 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 channel you use. It mostly was which anchor men they're all men at the time. Which anchor men you like best, and uh, but you essentially saw the same balanced view of the news. In 1987, under the Reagan administration, the Federal Communication Commission abolished the Federal Doctrine. Why? They said there are many many cable channels. You can watch what you want to watch. You can choose what you want to watch. The problem with that was that. When you watch news on ABC, you saw balanced view of the news. Now, if you want to get a balanced view of the news, you have to flip between different channels and no one does that. Everybody chooses a channel that they're comfortable with and that's what they're watching regularly. So now we've created cognitive filter bubble. People who watch Fox News, which is very conservative news, and people who watch MSNBC, which is a very liberal news channel, are seeing different realities. They're seeing different realities. They end up living in different realities. And now let's bring the internet into this. So when I when I went to Stanford in 1981, the internet was already there and even social media was there, early social media. In the Bay Area, there was something called the Well, which was a dial-up bulletin board. And if you're old enough, you may remember Usenet, Unix to Unix network. And again, this was social media, early version of social media. Now the culture, when I went to, the, to Stanford 81, the culture was still very much the culture of the, of the what's called the 60s. And very anti-establishment because it was, you have to remember that kind of the late 60s, early 70s, very much was against the Vietnam War. So very much against, against government. So out of this anti-establishment cultural movement, the hippies came the mantra information wants to be free. Now, information doesn't want to be anything, and even this information wants to be free. It's a partial quote from a longer sentence, but this philosophy stuck. So by the late 80s, Tim Berners-Lee invented, developed the World Wide Web, and he viewed unfettered public, public sharing for information. The early days were, were amazing. Suddenly, information that was very hard to get, suddenly it was all at your fingertips. But pretty much, pretty soon we realized too much information. How can we find stuff? There's too much, you know, imagine you have a, a, a library without a catalog. How will you find books? So indeed, the first approach was, let's have a catalog. So Yahoo, when Yahoo was, was founded in the, in, the, in the 90s, it was about a directory for the internet. And indeed, that's how you find information. You went to Yahoo at the beginning. But Yahoo couldn't keep up. The internet was going so fast. The web was going so fast. Yahoo couldn't keep up. So another idea had to come, which was search engines. And by the late 90s, Google came up with a very, very good search engine. And that's where we start now. We say we don't even say to search something. We said to Google something. Now, if information wants to be free, how can Google make, how can Google make money? They want to keep everything free. They didn't want to charge for search. So decided to copy the idea from mainstream media, newspaper and TV, and use advertising. So search is free but you get advertising. But pretty soon they discover that online advertising is not effective. On TV, you have captive audience. You're watching a show, suddenly it's commercial, you can go to the bathroom, and, and what they have done, they, they have increased the frequency and the length of the advertising. So the going to the bathroom strategy is not effective anymore. Um, so captive audience. Newspaper, they use like sometimes full page, large advertisement. They tried, if, you, if you're old enough, you may remember the beginning, people tried to have very large advertisement, but user hated it. So, so Google came up with another idea, micro-targeted advertising, which is much advertisements to individual preferences. How do you know about individual preferences? You have to gather personal data, and then you use machine learning to target advertising and content based on personal data. So when you do a search, when you do a search and I do a search on the same term, we're going to see different results and different advertisements. So the result again was filter bubbles, cognitive polarization. We live in different realities. And in 2021, in, in 2019, Shoshana Zuboff, a professor at Harvard, published a book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And it's a 700 page book. So you may not want not to read it. But I urge you to read an article she wrote after the January 6th insurrection. She wrote 
the coup we are not talking about. In Shirot, we can have democracy or we can have surveillance society, but we cannot have both. The, 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 the phrase that is used in Silicon Valley is, if you are not paying for it, then you are the product. Since you, we are not paying for, for Google, for Google search, for Google, uh, for Gmail, for uh, Facebook, that means we are the product. Okay, we're not customers, we are the product. Now, what does it mean that we are the product? So in, in 2018, Jaron Lanier Technologies wrote, the product isn't so much you as the ability to change the behavior of millions of people like you. And an economy James Plunkett wrote in 2021, the search engine or social media platform is a little more than bait there to hold our attention long enough to capture our likeness in data. Okay, the, that we are being baited so we can give away our data. And so you can run a query, what is Exxon? And you, different people see different advertisements. If Google thinks that you are liberal, you are going to see advertisement for carbon, carbon capture with nice blue sky and clouds. But if Google thinks you're conservative, you're going to see something about uh, that regulations are bad. So really different people live in different realities. Paul Romer was an economist at Stanford and he was, he was, he wrote about entrepreneurship and innovation. So he was a Silicon Valley favorite economist. By 2021, he changed his tone and he wrote, people are realizing the digital advertising model pioneered by Google and Facebook poses a growing threat to democracy. This theorem know more about citizens of the world's democracies than the Stasi knew about East Germans. They can exploit what they know without relying on the coercive power of police state. They can adjust what people see, and exercise control by a thousand nudges. And Facebook, in fact, took the ideas from Google and put it on steroids, okay? So their goal is, the goal of them, they decide what you're going to see on Facebook. You know, normally you can see that too, you, have, you may have, most people have too many friends to see everything their friend posts. Facebook decides what you're going to see. And they have one goal, maximum user engagement. So they went from micro-target advertising to nano-targeted advertising. And in fact, social media is called addiction by design. And, and sociologists have written at the fact that the way that the app is designed is to get you addicted to the app. Uh, at Rice, we did a project a few years ago with students and we gave them a, a, an exercise. For 24 hours, they have to abstain from using all devices. And then they had to write an essay about their experience. And naively, I thought they were right. Oh, it was wonderful. I had time. I went to smell the flowers. I took walks. I went and coffee with my friends. None of that. All wrote about how what a horrible experience it was. I couldn't connect with my friends. I don't know how I can drive anywhere because I'll be lost. Uh, it was a miserable experience. In fact, after I, I, I read what they wrote, I went to the Wikipedia article on withdrawal symptoms, and I concluded it was one-to-one. -one. They had classical withdrawal symptom. Withdrawing from social media was just like withdrawing from drugs. And there is tremendous amount of hypocrisy from Silicon Valley. I must comment on that. So you look, for example, at the following sentence. If you have nothing, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, Maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Who said it? It was Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of Google. But in 2005, CNET, which is a tech publication, wanted to find out how much personal information you can find by using the Google search engine. So they decided to use Eric Schmidt as their subject. And they just Google and find lots of information and they publish all the information they found. They say, well, you find them by Google. So it's free, it's, it's public information. And Eric Schmidt was so, so mad at them that for years, Google would not talk to CNET about anything because his privacy was violated. Uh, the age of privacy is over. Who said it? Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook in 2010. But in 2012-13, Mark Zuckerberg bought, bought a house in Palo Alto. And then he bought all the houses around so he will have privacy. So basically, privacy is for them, but not for us. Um, last year, Jonathan Haidt wrote in the Atlantic about social media and, and about the polarization of American society. 
And he said, the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel, the biblical Tower of Babel, is the best metaphor I have found for what happened to America in the, two, in the 2010s and for the fractured country we now inhabit. Something went terribly wrong, very suddenly. We are disoriented, unable to speak the same language or recognize the same truth. We are cut off from one another and from the past. Tower of Babel. So I want to spend a few minutes reflecting on what does it mean for us as, as computing professionals? And I'm reminded of a book that I read in 1985. My son was a teenager. He was difficult to talk to. So I decided I'll read all the books that he reads so we can talk about the books. And I read Ender's Game, which is a science fiction novel by Orson Scott Carl. And the story is, spoiler alert, Ender is a teenage boy. And he, he and his team think they're playing a video game, but actually fighting an intergalactic war. When they win the game, they've actually destroyed the civilization. And that's the end of the book. Oh my goodness, we've destroyed the civilization. And I feel a little like that right now. We thought we we're playing game with, with computers. Look what we have done. Uh, another way to put it, use the Star Wars terminology. We thought we're the rebel alliance. Turns out we're the empire. So there's a lot of talk today about responsibility. Some people talk about responsible AI. And I don't fully understand who's supposed to be responsible, the machines? The machines are supposed to be responsible. And some people talk about cooperation with social responsibility. And again, I'm a little skeptical of that. I'll come back to social responsibility of corporations in, in a few minutes. I think people have to be responsible. At the end of the day, machines are built by people. Corporations are run by people. People have to be responsible. And in fact, you can go to the ACM Code of Ethics. And this is the first sentence. Computing professionals' actions change the world. To act responsibly, they should reflect upon the wider impact of their work, consistently supporting the public good. So if you want to be a responsible computer scientist, very simple, support, consistently support the public good. And uh, here is how one, one student at Rice put it for me when we talk about it. He said, oh, it's going to be easy. I said, why? He said, look, I expect to have many job offers because I have a bachelor degree, Rice is in elite school, he said, I, ex I expect to get many job offers. I'll be in high demand. I can choose, I can choose the, the most, I can choose ethical companies. I don't have to, to, to choose uh, companies, even if just ethically questionable, I don't have to go to such a place. I'll have many choices. We're fortunate we have many choices. Now, when I start talking about the public good, some people say, oh, you're a Marxist Leninist. And so I want to remind people that the public good is a hallowed principle for, at least for American democracy. The very, very first paragraph of, of the constitution, with the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, pro pro promote the general welfare and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do or then establish this constitution for the United States of America. So the purpose of the constitution is the public good. The rest of the constitution is a mechanism how we have 330 million people in the United States. How do we reach agreement on what is the public good? And the answer is for this, this is the purpose of democracy. So we collectively reach agreement and compromises on the public good. But the goal of, of the country is the public good. In fact, Benjamin Franklin, when he closing speech at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 said, Thus, I consent to this constitution because I expect no better, because I'm not sure that it is not the best. The opinions I have of its error, I sacrifice to the public good. Okay, so he was not too happy with the, with the, with the constitution, but he says, I'm going to sign it for the public good. Now, of course, the public good is a, is a, is a, is a general principle, and we, it's not always clear what is the public good. And in fact, take something much simpler than that. You know, the sixth commandment says, thou shall not kill. Is it black and white? Of course not. What about self-defense? What about just war? Of course, we are going to debate. What is self-defense? What is just war? But the point is we make exceptions, even to thou shall not kill. So it's not always clear what is the public good. But sometimes I say, sometimes it's pretty clear. Take, for example, Uber. In 2019, Jacobin magazine, from the start, 
Uber's business model has been based on habitual criminality and a shocking indifference to human life. Now, Jacobin is a very, very left-wing magazine, so you may want to dismiss it. But in, in uh, July of last year, Guardian has a big expose about Uber because a whistleblower leaked over 120,000 documents. And Uber analyzed documents and concluded, Uber broke laws, do police, secret lobby government leaks reveal. So Jacobin was right. This was called Uber business model was called criminality as a business model. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our role as educators. If we produce students who are not socially responsible, then we are not being socially responsible. If we want to support the public good, we have to make sure that our students understand the concept. We can't make them responsible, but we should teach them about social responsibility. It must be part of the computer science curriculum. And I invite all of you to read an article I wrote two years ago with my colleague at Rice, Deep Tech Ethics. You can Google it and, and you'll find it. it was presented at, at SIGSI, Computer Science Education Con Conference in 2021. And it's very moving to talk to students about this topic because you see how you, you touch. It's, just, it's not just knowledge. You touch their heart. Here is a quote from a student essay. I believe that there was no problem that could not be solved by the all-powerful technology. It was only a matter of time before scientists devised the correct algorithm to solve all of the problems of the world. Looking back, I realize now how naive I was. So it's a very moving experience to teach this course to students. Students are very eager actually to learn. At Rice, we started this, we started teaching this course in 2018. And in this, this spring, the, fa the faculty voted to make it a required course and it was elective. Now it's required. And one reason that we voted to make it required, the student who took the course told us this course is so important, it must be a required course. Now, uh, Edward, Edward O. Wilson, who was a noted biologist, very distinguished biologist, died a couple of years ago. And he wrote, the true problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and the technology of gods. I'd like to rephrase it. I would say today's technology is taking advantage of our paleolithic emotions and medieval institution. I would describe today's technology as predatory technology. We are the prey. And four years ago, together with some colleagues in Europe, we launched the, the Digital Humanism Initiative. We published a manifesto in May 2019. We must shape technology in accordance with human values and needs, instead of allowing technology to shape humans. Uh, BMW used to have the slogan, the ultimate driving machine. And now they're being threatened by autonomous vehicles. So the change of slogan, the new slogan is don't be driven by technology, drive it. I think this is also a good advice to society. Don't be driven by technology, drive it. And I'd like to propose that maybe all computer scientists should, should, make, should take an oath. Uh, Doc, you know, physicians take the Hippo Hippocratic oath. Uh, some engineering school have Archimedean oath. I propose a Lovelacian oath. Why, Ed why Lovelacian? It's after Edda Lovelace. Edda Lovelace, you know, was a, a, a visionary of computing before there was even computing. And she had the letter exchange with, with Charles Baba. Charles Baba was an entrepreneur. He wanted to make money. And she wrote, I wish to add my might to expounding and interpreting the Almighty's laws and works for the most effective use of mankind. She talks about the public good. And my proposed oath is a solemnly pledge always to reflect upon the wider impact of my work, consistently supporting the public good, which is just taking the first sentence from the ACM Code of Ethics and pledging, yes, I will do that. Now, the world has changed over the past year. Whenever Time Magazine puts technology on the cover, you know that the world has changed. What you see here is, of course, is a dialogue with, with ChatGPT. And now everybody is running scared because of ChatGPT. Here's an article already from January of this year, how ChatGPT hijacks democracy in the New York Times. And I love this, uh, I love this cartoon. Okay, you show a man, he's getting a box uh, called AI. He opens the box, he's not looking. Behind him, there's a monster. And he looks at the shipping, shipping slip and he says, who the heck is Pandora? Okay, 
Remember, Pandora was after after humankind received the gift of fire, the God sent Pandora with all kind of uh, pestilence and and uh, and wars and famine, as uh, to punish us for for getting the technology of fire. So I want to go back to think about corporations. So in in 2012, Nick Bostrom published a book called Superintelligence, and he wrote about the danger of superintelligence, and the danger was of of just the danger of optimization, of maximization. So a thought, exper a thought experiment, you build a super intelligent agent and you give it the goal of make paper clips. And so it will maximize. And by doing though, it, it will convert the whole solar system into a paper clip factory. What Nick Boston didn't realize is we already have such agents that are called the, mo the modern corporations. The modern corporations are super intelligent because they find a way to concentrate the intelligence of many, many people together. They're more intelligent than any, any single person. And they're driven by one desire to maximize profit. So we have exactly the scenario of the paperclip maximizer. And if you want to think what's happening with climate change, all you have to think about the role that energy industry uh, played in here. I mean, Exxon knew about human caused climate change in the 1970s and they've obfuscated and denied it for years. So we have to deal with corporations. One problem is they're too large and too powerful. And, and two books have been published just over the past uh, five years. One by Tim Wu, Enter The Cares of Bigness, Enterprise in the New Gilded Age. Uh, uh, two years later by Zephyr Teachout, Enterprise Break Him Up, Recovering Our Freedom from Big Ag, Big Tech and Big Money. And, and Zephyr and Teachout made the following argument. We used to think that, that we need to bust monopolies because of consumer interest. But now it's different because, you know, we don't exactly feel, you know, that the size of Google affect, you know, we don't pay for the services. So it's not consumer interest. She said, no, there is another argument for enterprise democracy. Democracy cannot survive when certain players become too big and too powerful. And Kate Crawford, who wrote about AI, wrote in 2021, stop talking about AI ethics. It's time to talk about power. And here is another way we could, we could limit their power, something that I published in September. We don't realize it, but there are two legal, look, we live in two different legal systems. There is the, there, there is a overt legal system. And these are laws, you know, enacted by, by, by uh, in a democratic way. They're imperfect. Democracy, you know, democracy is the war system except for everything else. But when we use technology, there's another legal system. It's a shadow legal system. Every time you use technology, you sign a contract with the provider. By, it's a click-through contract. It's called license. It's a contract. And so it's, it's an alternative universe created by, by tech lawyers. For example, in the real world, if you make a product, if I use a, a, a blender in my kitchen and a blender blows up and I'm damaged, the blender a, a manufacturer is responsible, liable. In technology, you sign a contract with every technology provider. They are not liable. So the remedy is to nullify click-through contracts. Okay, we should, we should, if we want to have laws, laws should pass in a democratic way, not in a sub, in a subversive way like click-through contract. And I'll finish by 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 uh, paraphrasing Kate Crawford. Stop talking about AI technology. We shouldn't talk about responsible AI. It's time to talk about corporate power. Thank you very much.